Good morning and welcome to Avalon Church. It's so good to see so many of you here today. Good to see your beautiful face. Don't you think everybody looks beautiful today? Let's give everybody a hand. For those of you joining us online, I wish I could see your face, but uh, I'm sure you're just as beautiful. Thank you so much for joining us here at Avalon Church today. Well, today we're starting a brand new series called Generations, and we're going to look at a vision for what's next. Let me just kind of lay this out for you. It's going to be about four weeks long. Next week, I'm going to talk about how to create a hunger for God. You know, the Bible talks about that quite a bit, this hunger for God. The Bible says that those that hunger and thirst after righteousness will be filled. It tells us that Jesus is the bread, that Jesus is the water of life, that we are to partake in the body and the blood of Jesus through the bread and the wine of communion. And so the Bible talks about this hunger for God, that when we hunger for God, we're going to be satisfied. Anybody ever had just this desire for God? Maybe you needed a prayer answered. Maybe there was a, a, a strategic moment coming up in your life, or maybe there was a problem coming up in your life, and you had this, this strong, overwhelming desire for God, and you, you communicate with Him, you connect with Him, and how wonderful that felt. Wouldn't it be great if we could have that all the time? The fact is, I'll be honest with you, I love God, and I work at having a relationship with God, but I'm not always hungry to read the Bible. I'm not always hungry about that, but we're going to talk about that next week, how to create a hunger for God. And then the week after that, we're going to have a panel with Jesse, our student pastor, and Chelsea, our children's pastor, and we're going to talk together about what we need to do as parents and as a church together um, in really making a difference in uh, these kids' lives. We're talking about generations reaching the next generation for Christ. And then uh, the last week, I'm going to preach out of Psalm 78, the verse that you saw on the intro, and it says this, we will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about His power and His mighty wonders. We're going to tell the next generation. And that is our responsibility as a church. And today, what I'm going to talk about is this. We're going to go back to the foundation, <coughs> to, the big, <coughs> excuse me, uh, to the very beginning. We're going to talk about what a church's responsibility is to children and to students. And, and when I say children, I'm talking about uh, birth through when they graduate high school and so forth. What is a church's responsibility to the next generation? Now, when we don't take this seriously, what happens is uh, eternity is in balance. Churches die. How many of you have been in a church, and don't raise your hand, but how many of you have been in a church where there's nobody in the congregation below 75 years old, right? And the problem is not that I love old people, I'm getting to be in that category myself, all right? Uh, but the problem is not the age. The problem is they have not passed on to the next generation what God has entrusted to us. So what is a church's responsibility? Now, I want you to understand that this series is not just to parents or just to grandparents. This is for everyone, as you're going to find out today. This is about single adults, people that don't have children, teenagers, parents, grandparents, all of us, middle age, old, young, it doesn't matter what does the Bible say that we have a responsibility as a church to do in reaching the next generation for Jesus Christ? Well, I hope you'll be here for this. Uh, I think this will be very, very helpful. And uh, today, we're going to read from Deuteronomy chapter 6, and we're going to read several verses out of uh, this passage. Now, as we get ready to read this, let me just say that what God has called us to do corporately as a church is to tell the next generation about Jesus. We're to tell the next generation. We're to tell our neighbors. We're to tell the next generation that's just under us. We're to constantly be handing off the baton. And what you're going to see as we read this passage is that that application applies to us today. So let's begin reading uh, in uh, the book of Deuteronomy chapter 6. Here's what it says. 
Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now, Paul, just leave the verses up there. I'm going to kind of talk through this as I read. The word hear, it comes from a Hebrew word, which is shema. Hebrews know this as uh, the great shema. And it is literally in microcosm what they are to live in their relationship with God. It is literally for a Christian what we are to be, what the church is to be in our relationship with God. The word hear, it, you know, we know what the word hear means, right? Can you hear that? Turn the volume up. Wife talking to the husband, and he can never hear her. Can I get an amen right there? It's selective hearing, guys. Anybody besides me brave enough to raise your hand and say that? Okay. The fact is, that's not what it means. When Kim and I were first married, she had not learned to be direct with me yet. Because, ladies, let me help you with something. Men, they're not stupid. Men are not stupid. Okay, they're very intelligent. But men are much simpler than women. And by simple, I don't mean unintelligent. Women are just more complex. Their brain is able to do all kinds of multitasking, and they remember what you said and what you did 18 years ago, and they cannot let it go. Their brain is just kind of connected this way. Men, on the other hand, and, and women deal with stress by kind of like doing that, you know, talking it out. Men deal with it. You may not know this. There is a compartment in a man's brain. You, you ever heard of a man cave? All right. Everybody talk, knows what a man cave is, right? Well, there is a man cave in every man's brain. And you know, ladies, I'm going to let you in on something. Do you know what's in the man cave? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Now, once again, not, not, men are not unintelligent. That is, it's, here's how man deals with this. They go to that space. They've been in a long day. They've had problems. They come home. You know what they want to do? They want to go to that nothing space and just sit there for a little bit. And you're like, he's flipping channels. You can't be watching anything. He's not watching. He's in his nothing space. He's recovering, okay? So that's not what the word means. Because we can hear without really hearing. The word hear means kind of like a soldier saluting his commanding officer. Yes, sir, reporting for duty. Tell me what to do, sir. Tell me the mission, sir. Hear, O Israel. And the application is made to the church. Hear, Avalon Church. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now, that's a weird construction of a sentence. So what does it mean? Well, it, it simply means that uh, there's one God. We are Trinitarian. We are, uh, we are monotheists. In other words, we believe that there's one God. But the Bible teaches us that there's one God, but there are three persons to that Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And I love this. The word Lord there, uh, it is the proper name of God. So when he's introducing, this is this is, you can see, kind of a vision for the church. This is a vision for the Christian life. This is how we're to live. This is how we're to connect. This is what we're to do. Hear, O Israel, pay attention. Make sure you're going to obey. Report for duty. Very important. Hear, O Israel, the Lord. That is the Hebrew word Yahweh. We would say in English, Jehovah. And when God met with Moses and Moses said, who shall I tell them uh, that, that, that sent me? He said, you tell them that I am. You and I really, unless we really sit and think about it, we don't understand the significance of that. What's your name? I am. That's kind of a weird answer, isn't it? What's your name? I am. You are? Okay. Uh, good to meet you. I am. What, what does that mean? It, 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 it takes into context who God is. For example, there are several names that go uh, with Jehovah or Yahweh that make up the nature of God. Jehovah Jireh. I am the Lord who provides. Aren't you glad that God has everything under control? In a coronavirus pandemic, he ain't broke and he hadn't lost anything. He knows exactly where you are. Amen? The Lord, your God. I am the Lord who provides. Uh, 
I am Jehovah Rapha. I am the Lord who heals. He has the power to heal. I am Jehovah Nisi. I am the Lord, your banner. He puts that victory banner in your life. He fights your battles for you. He is the God that will never leave you. He is Jehovah Shammah. I am the Lord who is there. So when you begin to understand what is being said by Moses, this is a sermon by Moses to the nation of Israel. And he's telling them their responsibilities. He's, he's doing what Jesus did. Um, do you remember when in the New Testament someone asked Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? We're getting ready to read what he quoted. What's the greatest commandment? He, he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. And the second is love your neighbor as yourself. He said, everything in the Bible hangs on those two things. So Jesus was able to take the very complex and make it simple. You know there are a lot of preachers that are able to take the very simple and make it so complex that nobody understands it. Well, what God was showing us here is very simple, very direct. Here, listen, report. Yes, sir. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. By the way, Jesus claimed to be the I am. You ever hear his I am statements in the New Testament in the Gospels? He said, I am the door. If you're going to get to the Father, you've got to come through me. He said, I am the bread of life. He said, I am the light of the world. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father unless he comes through me. And so this picture of what we're to do as a church and what we're to do as individuals and how we're to have this relationship with Christ, it's very simple. It begins with hearing. Not just hearing, but saying, I'm going to do what's said. I'm going to follow what God says. I'm going to obey him. And it's about knowing God. You've heard me say many times, the most important thing about you is what you believe about God. And in this, God is showing us that it is knowing him that is the primary, most important thing in our life. That's critical if you're going to pass on what you know about God. You've got to know something about him, right? Okay? He said, so the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. So you've got you to know it. And then he gives us the second part, and I love this. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your might. Now, what is he saying there? He said, well, first of all, you got to know him, then you got to love him. There are a lot of people that know about Jesus, they just don't love him very much. Oh, they say they do, and when it comes to uh, things in their life, I mean, he's on their list. It's not like he's not on the list, but not necessarily the priority. Lots of Christians like that. Kind of lukewarm, half-hearted effort. That will not pass on to the next generation. In fact, it, it will pass on. Uh, if you have a lukewarm response uh, or a response to God, if you have a lukewarm relationship with the Lord, don't expect your kids to be on fire for the Lord because it won't happen. I mean, obviously God can do that. He can fire them up. But the fact is, as a responsibility uh, as a church and as a parent, as, a, as an individual, I've got a responsibility, first of all, to know God. How do you know him? Well, you receive Christ as your Savior. You go to church. You read the Bible. You get to know him. You hang around other Christians. You share your story. You get to know him. How do you love him? Well, love in the Bible is mainly rooted in action. This agape, and this is, not, this is Hebrew, the Old Testament, not Greek in the New Testament. But the Greek word for love, one of the Greek words for love in the New Testament is agape. It is this love of God. It is a selfless, giving kind of love. So if I'm going to love God with all my heart, it's not just an emotional response. Anybody, can you agree with this? Anybody can go to church and get the warm fuzzies, get the holy goosebumps, raise your hand, love the music, and say, whoo, that was awesome. We should do that. We should have that experience. I'm not downplaying the importance of that. It's very important. But I know a lot of people that can get their, you know, their holy on with uh, listening to Christian music, and they get the goosebumps, but they don't really live as if God has given us a mandate, right? So he says, Hero is for the Lord our God, the Lord is the one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your might. By the way, how we know that he's talking to us is that he is not just speaking individually to parents. He is talking to the entire congregation. So by the same token, he's talking to the church. So he's not just saying, hey, parents, here's what you need to do. 
He's saying everybody in the church needs to do this. And everybody in the church needs to help carry this load. And everybody in the church has this responsibility. What responsibility is it? Well, we're to know him, we're to love him, and we're to pass it on. This is what you're going to see in the next verses. We're to pass it on. Our responsibility as a church is not to get it and keep it. It's to get it and give it away. And by giving away, we get more of it. It's amazing how that works. God says, this is the responsibility of the congregation. So let's read on. He says, and these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your children. And you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise. He's saying all the time. right? And you shall bind them as a sign on your hand. And they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. By the way, uh, ancient Israelites, they would do this. These things were called phylacteries. They would take a little leather box and they would put this verse, you shall love the uh, hero of the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Uh, they would put it in a little leather box and wrap it and re- keep it on their hand to remind them. Or sometimes they would wrap it around and put it on their forehead. And they would have these little marks, uh, these little things on the side uh, doorposts of the house to remind them all the time that their responsibility was unique in that it was individual, but it was also corporate. It was the congregation. It was the entire nation. It was everyone's responsibility, not only to love God, to know God, but to pass on to the next generation about God. Then here's what he says, and I love this. And when the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give you with great and good cities that you did not build, and houses full of all good things that you did not fill, and cisterns that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant. And when you eat and are full, then, and I want you to notice these next two words, because I'm going to come back to them, take care. Take care. Care. I want everybody to say those words together. Ready? Take care. Say it now. Take care. What is he saying? Take care. Be careful. He says, be careful so that you don't forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of slavery. So what is he saying? He's given us this picture. He said, you got to get to know God. That's where it starts. If you don't know him, none of this matters. You can't pass on anything that you don't know. You got to know him and you got to love him. Our, our love is backed by our actions. So, in other words, you don't just sit passively by, but you get involved in the congregation. You get involved in the church. You, as a, uh, an individual, are part of a corporate responsibility to pass on to the next generation. So, it's not just parents who have a responsibility, it's grandparents and it's singles and it's teenagers and it's people that don't have children. It's all of us. It's middle age and young and old alike. Our responsibility corporately is to put our arms around each other in the congregation. So it's like a family. The church is supposed to be like a family. And we have this responsibility to, to know him, to love him, and to pass it on. And so the question then becomes, as he said there at the very end, are you guarding against this? Take care, lest you forget. And I think what he's saying there is very simple. It's really easy to forget. It is really easy, not only as a church, but as an individual to get so busy doing things that we forget to worship God. You ever get so busy working for God that you forget to love God? A lot of times that happens to us. We get so busy with life. We get so busy with all the things that we're doing. And what happens is we fail to take care. That thing that's supposed to be the center of our life, that thing that's supposed to be the most important focus in our life, it gets fuzzy. We we don't remember it. Why? Because life happens. And he said, you've got to constantly come back. And how do you do it? Well, it's really simple. He just said it right there in the verses that we read. He said, know him, love him, pass it on. Do this individually and as a church. So if you're going to be a part of the church, uh, you've got to be active in the church. You've got to love others by serving. You've got to 
be a part. You got to pass it on. You got to know God. And God doesn't ask you to be perfect. He just says, we've got to do all of this and be very careful that we do not forget. Well, so here's the question How does a church like Avalon fulfill this? I don't think, you know, you could argue with me afterwards if you'd like, but you would lose. And I'm not trying to be a smart aleck when I say this, because I know what this says. And I understand, I believe the Word of God is inspired by God. It's God-given. It's God-breathed. And so if He gave it to us, He didn't make a mistake in giving us this. And I am absolutely convinced that it, you can't do it alone. You can't be a Lone Ranger Christian. I know a lot of people want to do that, but that's not really the way it's designed so he says, what is a church's responsibility? What's an individual's responsibility in telling the next generation about Jesus? Five things, and don't panic because I know you're like, he's already gone over half the time that he's been given and he's not even got to his first point, and there are five of them. They won't be long, all right, so I promise you. How do you do this? First thing you gotta do is prioritize a dynamic relationship with God. He said, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So if we do not prioritize this relationship with God, our children will not either. Our teenagers will not either. If we don't prioritize this as a church, and if we don't prioritize this as individuals, it will not be passed on, okay? And, and so what God wants me to do is pursue that relationship with him. It's the first thing, the most important thing. And what God wants me to do and to understand is that this is not just an individual responsibility. It is also a corporate uh, responsibility. So here's the question. Just fodder for thought. I know that some of you have children. Many of you have children. Thank God we were able to open back our children's ministry and our nursery today. Let's give all those folks a hand. I know they're not in here right now, but it's such a blessing. Um, let, let me just ask you this question. Are you committed to the next generation? Have you ever thought about it? Are you involved? Do you bring your kids to church? Do you volunteer this church? Do you take church and student ministry, uh, children's ministry seriously? Or is it an afterthought? Or, or is it something that like, you know, church is on your list, but it's not, not like the priority because, you know, I, I talk with people all the time. In our family growing up, when I, after my dad got saved, it wasn't a question of if we were going to church. We just knew that that's what we were going to do on Sunday mornings. And, and, and so... There has to be this commitment, and you have to put that relationship with Jesus Christ at the top of the list. Did you know that the majority of people, in fact, 80% of people that ever get saved, 80% do so before they turn 16 years old? So if we have a problem in this nation with people needing the gospel, which, by the way, is the answer, it's not a political party, it's not a protest. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ that is the answer. And that is always the answer. It's always the answer. Now, um, look, if, if we're going to pass this along, if it's the priority, then we must invest in reaching people that are in student ministry, youth ministry, and, and children's ministry. If 80% of all the people that ever get saved do so before they turn 16, would it not be wise for us as a church to put our energy, our prayer, our resources into reaching children and teenagers? Wouldn't that make sense? I mean, if 80% get saved before they're 16 and 80% that live that life get grounded before they're 16, don't you think it's important for us, for this next generation to pour into? Well, of course it is. So we've got to pursue that relationship with God. Here's, here's the second thing I want you to see. You've got to seek authenticity. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your might. He did not say you had to be perfect. 
We say at Avalon Church, it's the perfect place for imperfect people. Why? Because there are no perfect people here. And if you're perfect, go to another church. All right, you'll ruin what we got going on here, all right? Well, there is no one that's perfect other than Jesus. We know that. And we don't pretend that everybody here is perfect, all right? But you've got to be authentic. You see, here's the thing about teenagers especially. They can smell when you're fake a mile away. They, they, don't, they don't have to wonder if you're not real, if you're not being real. And look, let's be honest. We all put on the Sunday face from time to time, don't we? We pretend that everything's great in our life when it isn't. Now, once again, you don't want to be one of those people that shares too much information. If I, I'm not making this up, I swear on a stack of Bibles, I have asked people in this church, how are you doing? And they go into great detail about their hemorrhoids and how they're bothering them. I don't want to know that. That's too much information, okay? So we're not talking about being the oversharing type. But you've got to be real because here's what we know. What you do is far more powerful than what you say. You can say all the right things and all the nice things, but not back it up with what you do, and you're going to be ineffective. And man, is this not true in life that what we do has far more impact than what we say I'm going to say this, my, my two daughters are here today, and uh, Brittany, our oldest daughter, is here, and uh, we love her very much, and then Brooke, our youngest daughter, is here as well, and we love her very much, and our son-in-law is here, Jonathan. You were expecting me to say we love him too, didn't you? All right, so Jonathan, we love, we love you too, all right, so no, we really do. He's a wonderful son-in-law. Um, the, just to illustrate this, when Brooke was about three years old... It, let me say this. We have three children. Um, uh, our son is in the middle, Brittany, Brandon, Brooke. Um, you know that one of your kids at least is going to have somewhat of your personality, right? Really? Uh, you know, look, and I know that she, Brooke is my daughter because how impatient she is of how uh, when you go places, she wants to get in and out. For her senior year, we took her to Disney World. That's what she wanted to do. And I was dreading it because we were going to be there like several days and, um, you know, spend all of our college fund on it, you know. So, uh, and, and I was like, oh, no, this, the lines are going to be horrible. It's hot. And we're going to be there till late at night. And it is going to be the most miserable night of my life, the week of my life. But I love my daughter. She wants to go to Disney World, so we're going to do it. But when we got there, she looked at me. When we got there, she said, Dad, we're going to go see this this and this, and then we're leaving. We're going to go sit by the pool. I'm like, yes, my favorite daughter. All right, so, sorry, Brittany, I'm just kidding. She's not my favorite. When Brooke was three, we were riding to church one day, and she was in her car seat. We were going to church. Did I say that? We were going to church, and when you go to church, you put your Sunday face on, you get nice, right? There was a little old lady in front of us driving, going really slow, really, really slow. Let, had her turn signal on and wasn't turning, and it was just like eating me up inside. But I had my children in the car. We were going to church. Did I say we were going to church? We were going to church, and I was getting my Jesus face on, you know, because I'm like the pastor, and I needed to, you know. And so, anyway... Um, I'm driving, and I'm just so proud of myself because I'm not saying anything inappropriate. I'm not ramming her in the bumper of her car, trying to knock her off the road so I can get to church on time. And our precious little three-year-old daughter, she leans up in her car seat, and she says, Move it, fool! And I'm like, oh, my gosh, you have been listening to your mother. What is wrong with you? <laughs> no, the problem was she was listening to me. And it, it really convicted me that a lot of things that I say I believe, I maybe didn't always back them up with how I acted. And here's the point. We have got to have authenticity as a church and especially with our children and our students. Third thing is you've got to develop consistency. He said, these words that I command to you today shall be on your heart and you shall teach them diligently diligently. we got to have a tenacity. You can't be passive about this. 
as a church, we must reach the next generation. It is our responsibility. It is our mantra. It is what God has called us to do. You know, one of the things that this pandemic has done is it has caused people to sit back and reassess what's most important in their life. And as a church as well, online is here to stay. We know that. We're reaching people all across our nation this way. We're going to continue to do that. I want to challenge those of you that can to come back as soon as you can in person because you don't want to get in the habit that can easily be uh, turned into not watching or not going to church, okay? But we have a responsibility. It it can't be a half-hearted effort. You've got to get involved and serve and be a part. Get your children here. You've got to make sure that you are consistent and tenacious. Can't give up. Here's the fourth thing. If we're going to reach this next generation, we must pursue transparency. You've got to be authentic, but you also must be transparent. He said, Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road and when you go to bed, when you get up. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders and write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. In other words, he says that the normal rhythms of life are the best teaching and learning moments. And what you and I must learn is that it's not enough just to come to church on Sunday. Now, we're glad you're here. But think about this. Student ministry, children's ministry. Some of you have blended families, and as a result, some of you have your kids every other weekend. And so let's just say that there are a lot of you that are in that category, and for you, what you're doing is you have um, you have your kids every other week. There's going to be a couple vacation Sundays there. Uh, There's going to be a few sick Sundays. So if you're faithful, if you're faithful, if you're faithful. We might get them 20 hours a year, 20 Sundays. You have them every day, okay? So the point is this. You, it's not enough just to get them here. You got you to get to church and you got to take church with you. That's what he's saying. It's the normal rhythms of life. That's where it's taught. That's where the gospel is lived out. It's not in this pretend Christianity. It's not in this fake stuff where we go to church and act like nobody sins. And the only people that are sinners are people that sin differently than we do. And we get to throw rocks at them and we get to have protests at them because they sin the nasty kinds of sins. And yet we don't read the Bible or know the Bible enough to know that it is the pride heart and the self-righteous attitude that God despises in us. So we got to we got to make sure that we're being transparent. We got to be authentic. We got to be real. And then the last point and we're done. And, and this is one I really want you to take with you. The last thing you got to do is you got to build some spiritual hedges. Practice spiritual hedge building. Remember I told you a while ago, and I won't read the entire thing again, but remember we, we said take care, take care, take care. Interesting word. The word picture in Hebrew is the picture of a shepherd. I want you to get this. It's a beautiful picture. It's a picture of a shepherd that builds hedges. That's literally what the word means, to be building hedges. And what a shepherd would do out in the wilderness, he would take rocks and sometimes brush, but he'd create a corral. And of course, he would put the sheep in that corral at night. And you know what he would do? He would be the door. Jesus, remember he talked about that? He's the door, okay? That's what a shepherd would do. And, and what God challenged the nation of Israel, what God is challenging Avalon Church and you as an individual to do is to be a part of building hedges. To be a part of building spiritual protection around your kids, around our children, around our students. It's vitally, critically important. Um, So what are you doing to build hedges? What are we doing as a church to build hedges? How are we protecting them? You know, the fact is some need Jesus. All need Jesus. And we're going to build hedges by 
preaching the gospel and making that the primary part of what we do, teaching them the Word of God. Our students, our kids, it is. You want to get our student pastor and children's pastor upset, just call it child care or babysitting, and you'll have a fight on your hand. You know why? Because they're not the church of tomorrow. They're the young church of today. We can't look at our next generation as, well, one day they're going to be vital. They're vital to the church now. Okay? And, and we've got to make sure that we're putting the gospel in them. Some need to be encouraged to not to give up. You need to build a hedge around your life not to give in, not to give up, not to let go, but to keep on, to keep on, to keep on. Jesus did it for you. He took every step to the cross. He could have stopped at any moment, but he did not. Keep on. Some need to quit letting your children run the home. I'm, I'm not going to get too deep into that. But the fact is, somebody's got to be the parent. Somebody's got to be in charge. Okay? And it's either them or you. And I know which one's smarter. And it's not you. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, the, the, the fact is, you've got more wisdom than they do. You've got more experience. God has given you authority in their life, so be in charge. Be in charge. By the way, um, you're going to be faced with problems just like you are with school. There are going to be kids they don't get along with. They're going to get in fights. They're going to get upset. When they get in middle and high school, they're going to have a boyfriend for like three minutes and then break up. And then it's, you know, they're all upset. Let me tell you something. It's your job. It's your job as the parent. It's our job as a church to be in charge, to keep on bringing them, say everything's going to be okay. It's our job. And so I really want to challenge you today to build hedges. Build hedges hedges. How do we build hedges? Well, we commit to bringing our children to church. We commit to reading the Bible with our family. We commit to pray with our family, with our kids. We commit to make our marriage and our homes stronger because one of the greatest spiritual exercises some of you could do for your kids is to work on your marriage. Um, we need to commit to resourcing the next generation. And then we need to commit to be a volunteer and a champion for the next generation. I wonder how many champions we have in here today. I wonder how many would be willing to pour into the next generation. I realize God doesn't call every person to do every same thing in the, in the church. I get that. I've been called to be the pastor of the church. God has not called me to uh, be a business owner, okay? But there are very important people in our church that are business owners that, that help in their way that God has called them. But I do believe this, corporately and as a church, we must build hedges. We must reach the next generation for Christ. Why? Because it is our God-given, God-called responsibility. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd help us to be hedge builders. Help our church to be the one that's going to tell the next generation about Jesus Christ. Help our church, help our people to step up and say, we are that church. We've decided that's what we're going to do. Father, we'll thank you for what you do. Of course, in Jesus' name that we pray and ask all these things. Amen. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.